לא אכפת לי שאת תהיי לבני והוא יהיה סייב, אבל אני לא מוכן להיות אינדיק. Good morning and thank you for joining us. The United States is battling to save the brokered talks between the Israelis and the Palestinians as the White House is blaming the meltdown on, quote, unhelpful unilateral actions both parties have taken in recent days. Yesterday, the Palestinian Authority officially submitted a bid to become a signatory to 15 international conventions and treaties. Palestinian officials claim these requests were made in response to Israel's failure to release Palestinian prisoners, as was previously agreed upon during the current peace talks. And late last night, the U.S. envoy Martin Indyk held an emergency meeting in Jerusalem, attended by the Israeli Justice Minister Tzipi Livni and by Saeed Barikat on the Palestinian side. With me in studio is our senior defense correspondent, Amir Oren. Good morning, Amir. Good morning, Yael. We're going to speak a lot about uh, the new signatories and, of course, uh, now going to the ICC, the International Criminal Court. Let's take a look first at this next report. Even the troubled Middle East isn't used to such heightened drama. Just as U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry had been piecing together a complex three-way deal aimed at extending Israeli-Palestinian peace negotiations, Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas decided to sign more than a dozen international conventions and shook the whole arena. The leadership agreed totally on signing a number of international agreements, and now I will sign them. Abbas's move followed a week of frantic diplomacy, including two unplanned trips to Israel by Kerry, struggling to put peace talks back on track. The crisis broke on Saturday when Israel failed to release the fourth and final batch of prisoners it had agreed to free in July. Seeking to overcome the impasse, Kerry tried to forge a deal. The Palestinians would continue the negotiations until the end of the year, while refraining from unilateral international initiatives. Israel would release the prisoners and another 400 detainees and partially freeze settlement construction. And the U.S. would release American-Israeli spy Jonathan Pollard. But only a few hours after details of the deal emerged, it started to crumble. Abbas announced on live television that he was advancing the Palestinians' bid for membership in 15 international agencies and conventions. The Palestinian actions prompted Kerry to cancel a planned return to the region, reflecting Washington's growing impatience with the stagnated negotiations. No agreement at this point in time regarding anyone or any specific steps. There are a lot of different possibilities in play. Even though the April 29th deadline for talks is still almost a month ahead, it is already clear that the American efforts to extend the negotiations have reached a breaking point. In the past year, Kerry made the process his personal mission, but without a genuine willingness to compromise, the mediator cannot want it to work more than the parties themselves. Amir, we heard uh, overnight that the Palestinian ambassador to the United Nations, Riyad Mansour, is now saying the Palestinians are going to go straight to the ICC. How much of a threat is that for Israel? A very hollow uh, threat, because uh, how are they going to get uh, to statehood from uh, such uh, gestures? And one should step back uh, a moment and look at what's happening here. There are two models for uh, an Arab-Israeli peace or peace conference. Both of them are the Camp David mm -hmm. models. Uh, when Begin met with Sadat in 1978, they cloistered themselves with Jimmy Carter for 17 days. There were crises, but eventually they emerged with an agreement. When Yasser Arafat and Ehud Barak met uh, under Bill Clinton's auspices in the year 2000, they emerged with no agreement. And Abbas is probably following in Arafat's uh, steps. There doesn't seem uh, to be any leeway here. And uh, both sides are uh, acting as spoiled children, telling the mother, if you want us to eat dinner, you must promise us dessert first. <laughs> The mother, the United States, should right. tell them, go to bed hungry, if that's what you want. But the, the mother, if I'll, I'll continue with this analogy, the United States and the White House especially, the Obama administration has put this as its top priority, put Kerry as, uh, you know, the, the leader of the shuttle diplomacy, as we call it. Are they, have they had enough? Are they going to leave the children alone? 
which is why they are stalling, they are playing for time. They don't want the uh, talks uh, to go under right now or until the 29th of um, this month uh, as uh, scheduled. They want to, to uh, push coins into the machine in order for the music uh, to uh, mm -hmm. keep playing. Uh, so because they are not uh, talking about substance right now, but rather on the uh, continuation of the talks themselves, uh, they will find a solution. Some prisoners, perhaps not all 26, perhaps not all Arab-Israeli prisoners, some will be released. Uh, Israel will get something in return, and the talks will go on when, as long as uh, Obama is focused on the Ukraine and other crises, they will try to push mm -hmm. it uh, into the fall. It's important to tell our, our viewers and listeners, in, in less than 24 hours, it went from a, a, a deal that would see maybe the Israeli uh, jailed spy uh, Jonathan Pollard release, plus another 400 Palestinian prisoners, to a complete meltdown. What was the trigger that, what was those few minutes that made it, uh, you know, go from one end of the spectrum to the other? The trigger was probably the uh, public or political reaction to what uh, the leaders uh, tried to draft. Because in, the, in a closed room or in a Harvard University simulation, mm -hmm. uh, it might look promising. But uh, when brought to uh, broad daylight and when um, the reactions of people on the right uh, in Israel and some in the uh, Palestinian community, when they were heard, uh, both Abbas and um, Netanyahu started uh, to backtrack. Mm -hmm. And then uh, it all um, uh, failed. It all failed. It's all breaking down. It's on the brink of disaster. Many will say that this entire framework deal has always been on the brink of disaster. We were heading for this uh, April deadline with uh, mostly chaos in the Palestinian territories and in Israel. Some are calling for a third intifada. It's been thrown around quite a while this past year. How close are we? But as President Peres always says, what is the alternative? Um, what is the alternative? The, the alternative is to try to uh, keep talking. Um, and um, we will see some tension rise. But uh, it doesn't have to break down completely, at least not yet. And politically speaking, Abbas, you say, is going through uh, Arafat's footsteps, although many, also on the Israeli side, you mentioned per President Peres, said that Abbas is the only leader that we have to speak with. Netanyahu also politically is in going, maneuvering his way between his right-wing coalition and the Americans. How much is this political uh, pressure actually pressuring these two leaders? Well, the, this is the paramount uh, consideration. Um, it, it is. It is, because, mm -hmm. because it doesn't matter uh, what uh, deal you have um, uh, with your uh, interlocutors, um, be it uh, uh, Obama or uh, Abbas. You must uh, put it to a vote, whether symbolically or actually, and your public has to approve. And right now, the public uh, on uh, both uh, sides of the green line does not seem to approve. And just quickly, uh, the April deadline is uh, around the corner. What is your, if you can speculate, uh, you've, you've uh, covered this issue for quite a while. Where are we going to be at the end of April? We have to um, undergo the Passover festivities uh, first. At the end of April, we will get uh, a three or four month extension. And this is Netanyahu's main goal because he wants to get to the midterm elections in the United States in November and see um, a, a Republican victory so that uh, Obama uh, being put pressure on. Uh, Obama's uh, power will be curtailed in the last two years of his term. Meaning it all boils down to politics, as we said. Amir Oren Hard, senior defense correspondent, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Yael. And on to our next topic. A new French cabinet was approved by President Francois Hollande following major losses for the ruling Socialist Party in the local elections. The reshuffle sees Manuel Valls stepping in as a new French prime minister. And although the French foreign minister and the defense ministers retain their positions, a familiar face from the past now stands out above all the rest. The new French Minister of Environment and Energy is none other than Ségolène Royal, who ran for presidency in 2007 and, of course, is also President Hollande's ex-wife and the mother of his four children. But putting the family affairs aside, many believe this new cabinet will mark a notable conservative shift in French policies on explosive issues such as immigration and economic reform. To make sense of this political drama, it is a political drama, we are joined in studio by Channel 2 News foreign affairs correspondent Asafi Haskeli. Good morning, Asaf. Good morning. A lot of uh, personal items going into the politics. Yes. But we're going to first see a quick uh, report. 
This is the new, quote, fighting government, comprising French President François Hollande and his recently appointed Prime Minister Manuel Valls. The new team was revealed Wednesday morning by the General Secretary of the Élysée. It is one much smaller and exhibiting gender equality. Eight men, eight women, including two new members. Notably, Ségolène Royal is making her political comeback. President of the Regional Council of poitou charente an unsuccessful candidate in the 2007 presidential election, she is the mother of Hollande's four children. She will take the reins of a large ministry, that of ecology, sustainable development and energy. Another new recruit is François Rebsamin. He is taking a big step in his political career, as this marks his first appointment as a minister. A close ally of Hollande, he will take charge of the labor, employment and social dialogue portfolio. As for the rest of the cabinet, no big surprises. Christiane Taubira retains her position at the Ministry of Justice despite recent scandals. Aurélie Filippetti will also remain Minister of Culture and Najat Valod Belkachem, Minister of Women's Rights. The 16 new ministers will hold their first council on Friday. Saf, this is a long-awaited comeback for Royale. She's a very experienced politician who yes. many say that her dismissal from public life was due mostly to her personal affairs. Yes, and the fatwa, so to say, that uh, <laughs> Miss Valérie triel the first girlfriend, the, the former first girlfriend, uh, held on her uh, while she was in the Elysee. I must say is a very interesting uh, item, uh, taking into consideration that 22 years ago to the day, uh, Ségolène Royal was appointed F uh, first time um, Minister for the Environment under the uh, presidency of François Mitterrand. And François Mitterrand did not want, thought it was too uh, courageous or too risky to put uh, a couple on his cabinet. So François Hollande was kept out, Ségolène Royal was put in, and now see what, what's going on. Um, it's another chapter in the very famous French book Sexus Politicus. I think they have to rewrite it again and again. And, it's the uh, best case studies for how, of course, uh, politics and family life are seep in better than yes, the Clintons. Yes, but she insists it is not anything, it doesn't have anything to do with revenge. She's here to fight for the ecology, to fight for the environment, and she has a very green agenda. And uh, she says that she wants to take uh, the majority of the French nuclear reactors, who are which are very aging and mm -hmm. old, uh, away by 2020, which is something that Holland uh, it was part of his agenda while uh, while on the campaign. And also, uh, it's a very thin and um, ample cabinet, uh, only 17 or 18 ministers, very. Um, uh, a, a very bold reshuffle. Hollande was forced to make many changes, of course, after the elections. Uh, the far right uh, gained a lot of power. His socialist party gained almost nothing. So bringing back someone like Ségolène Royal, who is uh, very popular uh, a few years ago, and, of course, using the political drama, is Hollande not making simply a political maneuver? I think he, what he needed was a new cabinet to help him promote his U-turn uh, on the economy. He wants to cut taxes on the business. He wants to uh, be something more of a rightist uh, economist. And uh, this is why this is the reason that he appointed uh, Bernard Valls mm -hmm. uh, as the prime minister, because he is seen as the right part of, of the Socialist Party. Although the, the, the finance minister is on the left side, but it's a kind of combination that should help him t tackle the economy. But I should also say that uh, if we take um, into consideration what happened with uh, um, uh, Nicolas Sarkozy as interior minister and under um, uh, Jacques Chirac as, as president, I don't know. It might be. It might turn out that uh, Bernard Valls is a too strong prime minister, mm -hmm. and that towards the end of the first Hollande presidency, Bernard Valls might want to replace him. Uh, Hollande's uh, ex, of course, uh, Ségolène Royal, said, I'm going to quote, can the French people name a single thing he has achieved in the past 30 years? Of course, the mother of his four children, married for many years, is she not seeking, perhaps, a way to get back to the political top? Well, she she always wanted she always to, was, to, yeah. to, to to get back into cabinet because she was like in the in the political desert when she was uh, very in, in the president of the region. Uh, she she was managing and a very good administrator, but she always wanted to get back to the national arena. And uh, uh, I believe 
I believe her. I mean, I mean, she she's said to be uh, not so charismatic, uh, but a good administrator, a good politician that that can manage, a, 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 be a good manager of of a portfolio or a, or a department. Mm -hmm. So so I don't think it's it's personal revenge, and it's certainly not uh, putting a finger in the eye of neither Julie Gaillet or Valérie Trier Villers. It's it's trying to get uh, the economy and the ecology back running. And the million dollar question, of course, is the French public. They voted. They they voted uh, against. Uh, Hollande for the most part. Uh, what do they think? What do they make, of course, of this whole? Uh, they they love. They used to love Ségolène Royal. Yes, and and uh, the, the, they did vote uh, um, François Hollande into the Élysée, but but uh, they they talk about this uh, mix of politics and emotions, but they don't really seem to care as mm -hmm. long as. Uh, they are good politicians, and uh, uh, François Hollande's um, approval rating got so low that he 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 almost had to do this reshuffle because it's it's not very usual for presidents in two years into their presidency and the first uh, 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 term to to do this major reshuffle. Indeed, Asafi Khaskeli, Channel Two Foreign Affairs editor. Thank you for thank joining you. us. And coming up next, in a landmark decision, the Australian High Court recognizes a person of a third gender. But first, some more of this morning's headlines. And welcome back to I24 News Morning Edition. We get to say now hello and good morning to Yasmin Kay, who joins us this week to discuss the news you may have missed while Scanning the headlines. Good morning, Yasmin. Good morning. I can only imagine what we're starting with. Yes. <laughs> what everyone's talking about and can't stop. Mm -hmm. uh, so the first story is uh, something from the New York Times about um, pollution and dust in Britain. Oh, good. I, was, yes. I, I thought we were going to start with Kerry. About no, you know, I decided not to talk about okay, that because I, I figured good. everybody's talking about well, it. Yeah. We're going to talk about pollution and dust in Britain. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, this is a story that actually has been picked up worldwide. Um, a combination of air pollution and Saharan dust. Has Saharan dust. Saharan dust. Dust. Yeah, there's Meaning health coming from the Sahara. Yes, exactly, okay. exactly. <laughs> Sahara and dust. <laughs> It's from Scotland, we call yeah. it Saharan Dust. Uh, Another so, thing that Scotland is doing to the Brits, okay. Yes, they're just trying to get back at us any way they can. <laughs> um, so, uh, yes, it's basically prompted uh, health warnings across the UK, uh, similar to what happened in Paris, if you remember, a of few course. weeks ago. Um, so, uh, it, I mean, re levels haven't reached what they were back in the 50s. Uh, there was a great smog in London in right, 1952 that killed 12,000 people. Which is oh, insane. It is yeah. insane. Over yeah. a few days, 12,000 people died. But where, was uh, Britain ready for this smog, so called smog? I mean, in France, as you said, in Paris a few uh, mm. weeks ago, they were prepared and they yeah. put in all kinds of restrictions on driving and so forth, uh, license plates with even numbers and so forth. Exactly. Was uh, London getting ready for this? Um, I don't think to the extent that France was, uh, but I mean, it should be, it's kind of picking up and it should be gone by tomorrow. So, so they're it's, just uh, keeping low and not doing much? Yes, low profile. So they're saying, to people who have kind of um, heart troubles, lung problems mm -hmm. to stay indoors. I think today there's been another health warning issued for kids to stay out of the playgrounds if they suffer from asthma or from other respiratory infections. What's but generally interesting it's, about uh, this and, and was in Paris is, is these are just like one day uh, pollution days. Does mm. it actually do anything in the long term for policy, for, for legal uh, ramifications? For lo long term, it's possible that yes. I mean, people are saying that although this kind of Saharan uh, dust front has gone quite quickly, the reason it's actually so severe is because there's already high levels of pollution in the UK. So, you know, there, there have been calls uh, not just due to this in the past right. from environmental groups and other groups as well are saying, you know, the levels of pollution in the capital and in the southeast of England are too high. I guess it has to just What's get What's being really, discussed around the world yeah, as well. You know. Really bad until, it, until someone actually does something. Yes, exactly. Right, what so else? hopefully that will pick up. Uh, another story is, again, something that's been gone, going viral this week. This is uh, stolen paintings that were recovered in um, a kitchen in Italy. <laughs> These are paintings by uh, Pierre kitchen. Bonnard. No. Yeah. Less. Not in the living room, in the kitchen. kitchen wall. Yeah. These are worth now about over 10 million euros at least, according to the minimum estimates. Wow. Uh, artwork by uh, Paul Gauguin and Pierre Bonnard. Wow. This is an Italian worker who bought these paintings years ago. I think he bought them in the 70s uh, for about, I don't know, 23 euros, the equivalent of 23 euros. Okay. So what was um, stolen? 
Well, these two paintings were stolen in kind of quite an interesting heist back in London in the 1970s. Uh, some burglars posing as alarm thieves, uh, not alarm thieves, alarm technicians, mm -hmm. got the... Um, uh, the woman in the house to go into the kitchen to get them a cup of tea and they cut the paintings out of their frames and later left them on a train in Italy. I yeah, don't know why. Yeah. So for some reason... Maybe they, they didn't realise it's like a real Gauguin or something like well, that. Well, yeah, they left them on the train and then the Italian authorities picked them up. They just kind of put them in lost property, didn't realise... that. Yeah, they didn't realise the significance of the work. So they right. later reached auction and this guy who was just a kind of art lover, you know, bought them. But he, he was, put it in, in, their, in, in the kitchen. kitchen. I mean, it was only can, years later. The marinara sauce could have, like, you know, splattered, could have splattered on it. Could splattered on it, all the cooking oil as well. Interesting. Um, so how was it found all of a sudden? Well, basically his son was looking for an art book and he noticed some similarities. <laughs> between the work and the style of one of better. the painters. Yeah, this is wow. like, do you remember that Fabergé egg that was found recently? <laughs> yes. That was amazing. So this guy basically was like, okay, I better get it checked out. And it turns out they're worth a minimum of 10.6 wow. million. Wow, so he's not going to get the money. Uh, what, I don't actually happen? know. You know, that wasn't actually covered in the articles I read about it, but, I mean, he might. Yeah, It depends all, all on the estate of the person who... Where it came from, yeah, originally. Where it came from originally. Interesting. Someone's going to be coming a little uh, richer uh, today. Yes, definitely. Nice. What else? Uh, okay, so uh, Sky have been reporting about the uh, organized crime gangs in uh, Japan, the Yakuza. They've actually launched a new website. So this is a part of the Yakuza's attempt to boost its ailing membership. Yakuza numbers are down okay. in Japan. And they've got a very strong anti-drugs message. In fact, historically, the Yakuza are very anti-drugs. They see it as a and sign of weakness. What? Well, pro um, kind of uh, very, very strong set of values, I think, based on the samurai. You mm -hmm. know, if you were, they famously cut off their little finger if they uh, break one oh. of the values the groups has founded upon. Now, they're trying to basically I represent themselves. I see that in the picture. You can see. <laughs> yeah, you can see the missing pinky. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So they're trying to rebrand themselves as more of a humanitarian organization yeah. as well, focusing um, on their efforts in cleaning up after the uh, Fukushima disaster. Wow. But, I mean, they are, you know, Still criminals. Criminal they're game. an organized crime gang, yeah. But, I mean, they actually are kind of, in Japan, they're treated as celebrities, really. They've got so the website of... is uh, basically a, an about us kind of thing? And... Yeah, they've got a corporate <laughs> song in a traditional folk style extolling the Yakuza spirit of chivalry. Uh, another video shows them pounding sticky rice for a New Year's festival, photos of them helping in the cleanup, helping uh, after the earthquake in uh, 1995. The and the tsunami can't really, really do much about it. No, I mean, the Yakuza members have been jailed in the past, but generally, I mean, like I said before, they occupy a kind of very um, uh, large role in popular culture. I mean, mm -hmm. they're a And membership's not illegal. No, they're not actually an illegal gang. Wow. Their activities, I think, are illegal, but it's not illegal to be Yakuza. What else do you have? Okay, so the next piece is, I don't know why I'm laughing about this, this is a, a chainsaw <laughs> that was embedded, I think they have a photo, in a tree surgeon's neck. The guy survived, he was fine. Why are you laughing about this? Well, no, it, it, I'm laughing more at the, with the response of the doctor, which I loved. No, and the, and the headline, I mean, it's pretty... The headline's good. Yeah. And the doctor, I was kind of a little bit disappointed to find out that he's not British, the doctor. <laughs> and this was in America, who, who basically <laughs> said he was appropriately upset when he came in, but his death was not imminent. So I love this. This guy has got a chainsaw embedded in It's like in a British way of neck. covering an American story. Yes, I liked it. It was very <laughs> stiff upper lip. Just, he was appropriately upset. He didn't lose control and he was fine. Apparently he could still speak when embedded he was admitted. Embedded in, okay. Yeah, the, it, it kicked it back. He was oh. uh, pruning a tree. Chainsaws have kicked back. Right, And I don't apparently. think he was prepared for it. Kicked back, lodged itself in him. He could even speak. When he got into the hospital, he said he and didn't say much. Okay? He was yeah. like, "My name is James." That was yeah. about all he could manage. And all's okay. All's fine. Yeah, right. he's going to be released soon. He's okay. Watch out for those chainsaws. What Watch else? out for the chainsaws. So this next story is brilliant. This is uh, a woman um, went out on night out in Spain. She met a guy. You know, things got a bit amorous. They ended up having sex on top of a well covering. And the well covering fell. This she, is funny. She fell down a well, oh, and the guy just funny. fled okay. the scene, That's leaving horrible. her trapped in a ten-meter well. This is like you know the analogies <laughs> that can come out of this one. It's so bad. All's well that don't don't ends me. in the well. <laughs> don't leave me underground here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so mean, I'm not gonna. Fun. I'm not gonna actually say her name. Her name was actually in the article. I okay. figure this poor woman yeah. doesn't need more people no. mentioning her name. But like, this, where did this happen? This happened in Spain in um, do, 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 Ciudad Real. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that yep. incorrectly. Uh, but does this mean romance is dead? 
I mean, he just he just leaves her in a well. I mean, there's a, you know, this happens all the time, but leaving someone in a well, I think, is a little bit hard. The end that, of romance. That is and luckily, romance. she could swim. I mean, there was water in the well. And, and she just called for help and said... No, a passerby heard her crying for help oh, and called gosh. the police, and she was down there half naked, nearly suffering hypothermia. She was in shock. She was freezing cold. What do we learn from this? So many lessons. Well, well don't have sex on top of a don't well. Don't have sex on top of a well. Uh, <laughs> well, don't fall down a well. Is that another lesson? I think that I, I'll stick with the first lesson. That was the first good lesson. one. Yes, you'll be back with us. Thank <laughs> yes, you for joining thank us. You. On to our next topic. History has been made in Australia as the country's high court decided to formally recognize a third gender, meaning acknowledging a person's right not to be identified neither as a male nor a female. This ruling is a result of numerous appeals by Noria, transsexual who was refused in 2010 to be registered as, quote, sex not specified. However, the Australian High Court now concluded that a sex court category is not binary and contains more than default male or female classifications, and therefore the Australian state law and documents should reflect a third gender option. To learn more about this monumental legal battle and its implications, we're joined now in studio by the Gender Council and gen Transgender Rights Activist, Nora G Greenberg. Good morning, Nora. Thank you Good for morning. joining us. This is unprecedented worldwide, right? There's no other case that you can think of, probably, that this has happened. Well, uh, yes, uh, but it qualified, yes. Uh, first of all, uh, a, corre a correction is of order. Yes, okay, please. because Because the... The media has been has been mixing things up because there's a, there's a mix-up of, of concepts here. Okay, this is not about gender. This is about sex. Okay, and what happened was that in New South Wales, in the in in in, in, uh, in where, where Nori lives, mm -hmm. um, they have been for for several years now uh, categorizing intersex babies whose sex whose uh, genital sex cannot be defined as male or female, as non-defined, mm -hmm. okay? That category exists already for newborn uh, infants, intersex infants. In Australia or In worldwide? Australia, okay. in New South Wales, okay? And Nori is the first person who was uh, surgically reassigned, okay? And she uh, doesn't define as male or female. Male or female are biological categories, are sex categories. Mm -hmm. And she says, she insists, she, since she doesn't identify as male or female and her body is neuter, okay, she requested to be registered as neither male nor female. And neuter would be acceptable, or is that something completely it's different? It's not defined. It's not defined. Not defined. Okay. It's a third category. This has nothing to do with her gender. The fact that she happens to not define herself as either a, a man or a woman is, of course, part of her self-definition, but the, the Australian High Court decision mm -hmm. has nothing to do with her gender. Okay? It's a third sex category. But okay. it's interesting that, uh, of course, there is a very uh, distinction, big distinction between sex and gender, as you're pointing out. Yeah. What does Nori define herself in gender-wise? Well, gender-wise, the way I understand it, uh, Z defines it as, as a third gender, as a non-binary gender, okay? She, she doesn't define herself as a woman or as a man. But you still refer to her as she? Well, actually, should should refer to her as Z. Z is the, the, the yeah. non-gendered uh, pronoun in English, yes. What's the case here in Israel? I mean, we were looking at Australia, and you, as you say, it is unprecedented. It hasn't been... Uh, well, in Australia, there is a legal basis because, as I said, the law in New South Wales recognizes the possibility of a person not, not. being defined as either male or female. It's the same, say, as in Germany. Germany, a few months ago, this uh, new law uh, took uh, effect mm -hmm. where uh, babies, newborn babies, who cannot, whose genitals cannot be recognized as, as male or female, uh, can be left unregistered uh, on, in, in their sex, okay? Right, um, and here in Israel? And here in Israel, no, we, we, the, 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 the sex registry is, is totally binary, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, but interestingly, the Israeli law does not define how is sex determined. Okay, the law says that the Ministry of Interior is uh, to register the sex of citizens, but it doesn't say how is this sex going to be defined. The only exception exception has to do with transgender people, where 
the Ministry of Interior requires for a person to change the gender marker to show proof of uh, sex reassignment surgery. Mm -hmm. And this is something we are contesting. Uh, we have been contesting to for several years because yeah. we, we claim that that this has no basis in the law and this is highly discriminatory. Mm -hmm. And the state has no business in requiring a citizen to undergo surgery or any medical treatment just in order to, to for, for their gender identity to be recognized. This is contrary to the international consensus. By the way, in the case of Nori, yeah. okay, there we still have the problem. I mean, Nori can define her, uh, uh, herself uh, as, as, as a third category or non-defined, but this is because she had surgery. I mean, just uh, any other person uh, out of the street, uh, they cannot uh, ask to be uh, defined as, as neither male or female. Me meaning the law is not as liberal as we might have we might well, be portraying I, it as in the media. And I, think, I think the implications are still to be seen, but, that, but I think it's, it's very significant, the fact that person uh, uh, coming and saying, well, it's not just male or female. This is something that uh, nowadays is, is, is in, 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 in the gender-informed uh, uh, discourse. Circles, yeah. uh, we know uh, for sure that male and female are not the only possibilities. What does this do for uh, transgenders worldwide? A case like Nori's, does it give, uh, does it give well, think, any kind of precedence in other countries? Or because everyone has, as you say, their own legal definition of what goes on uh, here, it's the Ministry of Interior. In Germany, it's different. Does it change per country, or is this something that we can see as a global, uh, maybe a, a global breakthrough? Yeah, well, I think the implications are still going to be uh, discussed, but I think my opinion is that, first of all, this story undermines the common belief that, that sex is something binary, okay, that it can be either male or female. No, there are other possibilities, because in, in reality, right. nature makes more than two possibilities. And gender, is also an, an open uh, space, okay? And, and many people don't identify as, as, as men or women. And, and that, and that so is the biggest highlights, uh, this distinction. This highlights the yeah. complexity and the richness right. of both gender and sex. Nora Greenberg, thank you for joining us this morning. It was a pleasure having you. After Thanks. the break, giving economic cooperation a chance in Israel. We're going to speak to Daniel Roth. But first, let's hear some more of this morning's headlines. Hey, morning. Thanks so much for coming. No problem. Big fuck up. What happened? It was actually, it's actually a pretty funny story. Um, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Hi.
Welcome back. It's still Thursday, April 3rd, 2014. This is still the Morning Edition, and I'm still Yael Wisner Levy. Thank you for staying with us. Sikui, an Israeli NGO, non governmental organization, was established in 1991 to help lift Israeli Arab communities out of the cycle of poverty. One of their most ambitious projects aims to incorporate Arab villages into existing in industrial zones and build new industrial zones incorporate, incorporating both Jewish and Arab settlements. More in this report by Daniel Roth, who's here with me. Daniel? Hey, good morning. So you went up uh, to different industrial zones around the country, and what did you find? Well, I, uh, there's gross, gross inequalities. Um, <clears throat> this is just a fact of, of the landscape here. 2.4% uh, of the industrial zones that exist, only 2.4% mm -hmm. are in uh, Palestinian cities in Israel. Um, so you're talking about a huge, huge gap. Uh, unemployment is is a much bigger problem uh, in almost every uh, Arab city. It's it's a much bigger problem than in the country as a whole, and the economic gaps are very, very wide. Let's see this report that you prepared along with Anthony Lesney. In Dabouria, a town 15 kilometers from Nazareth in Israel's north, amongst the population of mostly Palestinian citizens of Israel. Unemployment hovers above 12 percent and debt is a common issue. The town is looking for a way to grow and increase the business it does. So the head of the regional council, along with elected officials from a variety of backgrounds, are working with Sikui, an organization that works to end inequality between Arab Palestinian citizens and Jewish citizens in Israel. They are talking over new projects in order to attract new capital to the region and ease tensions between the different peoples that call it home. The things that we actually succeeded to do is to create the basis for cooperation, and we did that. It's not easy in Israel to do that between Palestinians and Jews. We did that, and with this platform, with this basis, we can actually build on it in tourism, environmental, and industrial zones. Sikui, with municipal funding, has created a tourism association that brings Jewish and Palestinian heritage together for visitors, a first in Israel. Sikui hopes to attract further government support for the project. We are working in order to present this unique project to the tourism ministry so they will understand the big potential of it. For that, we show them two things. First, that there is a group that has those touristic products and a financial investment. We say that this association will grow and develop in the future and we will show the development statistics and how the authorities can be a part of it. Second, we explain that we are going to test financially the meaning of this touristic product. Another goal of theirs is to create an industrial zone, but this may prove to be difficult given that Palestinian citizens of Israel are rarely afforded building permits. So the plan is to partner with Jewish communities. 97% of the industrial zones in Israel exist in Jewish towns only. And where there is cooperation, it is between Jewish towns. What we are trying to do is to expand the picture, to include Arab towns in existing industrial zones so that they can also benefit from the taxes and the revenue of these industrial towns, and to build new industrial zones, incorporating Arab and Jewish towns so that they can benefit and bring the entire region up. Sikui has already achieved results in the Vadiara region south of Haifa. In the 2000s, after violence in the region had subsided following the Second Intifada, some communities united to develop the tourism industry there. The positive experience is feeding optimism amongst the leaders in the Israel Valley region. We think the fact that we started with this process will eventually lead us to finish it. We will achieve good cooperation, which will lead to mutual life of Arabs and Jews. That's the most important thing, more than the economy. That last uh, quote, of course, is I think is, is maybe the most important lesson, that it is not only about the economy, it's more about uh, cooperation, coexistence, and so forth, which we've seen in many different other areas in Israel. Economic cooperation is one that still has a lot to go. Right, and uh, we actually were speaking with Yanim Sagi, the director of the Givat Chaviva Center for uh, Jewish Arab Partnership in Israel, and they actually deal there with mostly uh, 
sort of civil society uh, outside of the scope of economics and more in the scope of education and arts and kind of uh, uh, culture building. And what he was saying was, was economy is important, obviously, when you see gross inequalities, mm -hmm. you need to make structural changes. And it's good that Siku is doing this, but without the content, without changing the form, without kind of changing the content, really leaves people at a loss and really leaves these projects uh, uh, kind of dangling in the wind right. without, without enough support, you know, real passion behind them. Uh, from people who really know each other and really care about each other. So it's, it's, it goes hand in hand. And if you also look at the regional kind of implications, of, there are many people, of course, uh, many of them from the left, that will say economic peace is the best kind of peace to go for forward in the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict, of course. Build economic ties, build joint uh, cooperation uh, be, uh, between borders, and you'll go much farther than building content. It goes the other way. Right. So I think, you know, uh, after this journey, it can be said that both are important. You know, you've got a situation here where in Israel, uh, uh, in the internationally recognized borders of Israel, there are less tenders for building given to Palestinian citizens of Israel than there are to settlers in what are occupied territories. Right. And, and uh, so when you look at these kinds of inequalities, you're talking about real structural changes that need to happen now. There are also millions of people who live right next to each other, in neighborhoods right next to each other, in villages right next to each other, uh, and go to each other's restaurants, and uh, in some cases share, you know, go to the same PTA meetings. Yeah. Um, but there's such a disconnect. I, I was talking to someone who was telling me that uh, they witnessed an 85-year-old kibbutznik from Vadiara go for her first time to uh, to a village nearby. First time she had ever been to a Palestinian wow. village, um, and she had lived here for you know most yeah. of her life. So yeah, you're talking about deep need for structural change, uh, deep need for for cultural change, right. and you know. Without both of those movements, uh, you know, we may be at a loss. And what does Sikui put at the NGO, of course, put at its forefront? What is it trying to teach? Is it obviously through education, educating the public that, yes, this 85-year-old woman from a, a, a Vadiara can go to the neighboring village? Right. So they're, 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 they have a few focuses. Um, and it's a sort of within their Equality Zones project. They're working on public transportation, uh, environmental quality, um, uh, tourism and industrial zones. And, and th what they're trying to do with these is not only do the educational bit, the educational side of things really changing people's minds, but actually changing the reality on the ground and, and uh, creating a, a, a structure that can be equal so that people can start to view themselves mm -hmm. as equal and each other as equal. You mentioned, of course, uh, the settlers versus uh, Palestinian Arabs within Israeli uh, recognized borders. It, it does boil down to politics at the end of the day. Sikui and other NGOs can do only so much. It's something that comes from above. Yes, absolutely. And, uh, you know, there is power from below, and that's, I think, what organizations like Givat Chaviva and Sikui believe, that, that whether it's structural change or cultural change, uh, the, the power can be welled up from below to change those politics. But you're right, absolutely. At the end of the day, we're talking about politics. We're talking about policies that allow for these kinds of inequities. Daniel Roth, the economic correspondent. Don't forget to watch The Economy magazine today at 7.10 here on I-24 Israel time, of course. Thank you for joining us. No problem. And we get to say hello and good morning again to Yasmin Kay, who is here with What's Hot on the Web. Yasmin, you brought really hot stories until now. I can't get that woman <laughs> in, in the well off my head. Yeah, I keep on thinking so of we'll, really we'll bad puns that, yeah. about that. I'm not going to share. Continue with that trend. <laughs> OK, so uh, the first story is a Sky Story about a protest in uh, Turkey. So um, there's been a lot in the media about the fact that uh, there was a ban on Twitter as well as YouTube. So people have started protesting via cats. Uh, now this <laughs> happened, I love this, this said, Do you enter, did you enter the substation? This was because recently the energy minister right. blamed some power cuts in uh, Ankara on a cat. He on said a, cat. a okay. cat entered the power distribution unit and that's why 
the, you know, there were power cuts. It's not so because Erdogan has banned Twitter or YouTube and, and maybe other things. It's a cat. Okay. It's to do, yeah, so basically st people predictably uh, started making kind of little memes uh, about cats. And it went pretty viral, I understand. Yeah, I mean, cats are, they, they make up most of the internet. I know. There's actually a really interesting theory <laughs> that, um, pe that basically people, um, use cats as a as a method of protesting when they don't even want to protest but if you actually block people's access to twitter and to youtube and all this kind of stuff they can't see cats and they want to see cats which is why they protest yeah, are you a cat cats. person i am actually i'm not yeah well i, I have a dog but we, yeah lavi is a cat person i'm a oh, dog really? person yeah uh, no, it I changes. love cats yeah. are amazing. I mean, dogs are lovely, but like cats are amazing. Brilliant. Yeah. Okay. I won't say anything. I don't want to get anyone uh, riled oh, okay. up. Yeah. yeah. We don't want to have a fight over the, over over the table. These are no. the real <laughs> issues that divide us. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> cat people or dog or people? Dog people. It's a, it's a totally different kind of person. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so our uh, next story is also on an animal theme. This is a lovely story in America about the amazing bond between a woman and her pet kangaroo. Oh, there I can. Yes. I, 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 Look. I, Relate more to kangaroos than I do to cats. So let's put it that uh, way. Really? Of course. Look, they're what? hopping dogs, basically. Yeah, they're hopping. <laughs> well, this kangaroo it, like follows her around the house. Wow. Yeah, loves her, and she's got clothes for it, which I don't know how I feel about that. But, I don't know. Um, if, like kangaroos are illegal. I mean, I guess they are. But where is this in the United States? This is. She bought the kangaroo from a farm in Texas. This there is a go. woman Texas, in Virginia. You know, it has its own rules there. So she, I think she's living in Virginia, and this is her cat, Boomeroo. Which wow. is cute. That is cute. Her kangaroo, even boomerang. Wow, uh, nice. <laughs> um, yes, so another story I want to talk about, also involving animals, is in The Independent. This is a baby elephant that wandered into a uh, person's <gasps> living room. Oh. Now, what's great about the story is that the elephant had actually wandered more than 30 miles. Wow. So it was separated from its mother. This is in South Africa in Zululand. And it just wandered through the bush and arrived at this woman's house, actually knocked on the door in a stressed state they managed to calm it down and get it a bit of water obviously I, called I don't know who authorities would be more stressed if an elephant came knocking at my door i would be that, really happy if that turned up i i would but yeah, i think in my initially reaction i think i would freak out yeah i mean I, you wouldn't expect it <laughs> if you kind of woke up by so she knocking called the at the authorities door. or she's also going to keep it in no 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 she's called the authorities they're taking care of the elephant oh, hopefully Tom. reuniting Tom her the elephant. with uh, the mother yeah, yeah. well i'm, I'm the name's Tom? The name is Tom. Did I just make that up? Yeah, no, 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 no. The name is Tom, <laughs> but it is, it is a she. She's called Tom. Oh, she's called Tom. Yes. Nice. Well, cute. Very, yeah, very cute. cute. <laughs> now, something less cute, but I found amazingly funny. This is a drunk Alaska priest who was found with <laughs> guns and drugs. <laughs> no. So this guy um, was basically pulled over uh, a few days ago. Sarah Palin country, you know, yeah, anything can happen. Sarah Palin country, seriously. Very so close to Russia. He was uh, very close to Russia. <laughs> you can see Russia. You can it's, see Russia. Yes. Maybe he was looking at Russia and he's looking he at what's happening distracted. in Ukraine, in Crimea, and got he distracted. He got distracted. That's a, that's a very creative excuse. He might use that. Yeah. Uh, so he yeah. was weaving his pickup truck across the highway. He was also speeding. So when he got pulled over, um, he uh, seemed disorientated. They, uh, the policeman asked for his vehicle uh, registration and he produced a receipt. <laughs> <laughs> and then the trooper asked, do you have any weapons on you? And he was like, yeah, I've got a 357 in the back seat. But he neglected to mention that he also had a nine millimeter in his pocket. Oh. And he had a small bag of marijuana on him as well. This those is amazing. Priests, it's like those priests in what, Alaska. What denomination? Drunk. Sorry? What denomination is he a priest I don't for? know, actually. It doesn't say in the article. <laughs> hmm. No, it does. It does. <laughs> Catholic. Catholic. <laughs> yes, he's been placed under on administrative leave by the Catholic uh, diocese of Fairbanks. I need so, Sarah Palin's reaction to get the story. But this is know. amazing. Like, it gun is, toning, dr like, marijuana puffing. Also named Tom. Drink, dr no, <laughs> no, he was called Sean. Uh, Sean, there Father you go. Sean. All right, stop uh, looking at Crimea and getting high doing yeah, so. Yeah, exactly. That's what I think. Happened. So, uh, and all, a bit further south, back in uh, in uh, the USA, this is in Louisiana. Now, a teacher went to Starbucks, ordered a couple of coffees, and I think we have a photo here. She she got this. One's a pentagram and the other's a 666. What? <laughs> so she posted this on the Starbucks Facebook page. And I loved her, like, comment. She could have been really rude. Right. She said, the star is almost OK because it's in your Starbucks logo. Ago. The 666, however, was quite offensive. I am in no way judging his, the barista's beliefs, or dismeriting his beautiful artwork. I am, however, judging his lack of professionalism and respect for others. That's such a eloquent so, way of yeah. saying, like, 
what what's going on, people? Yeah, she's <laughs> saying, like, well, like, look, I find it disrespectful. It's okay for him if he wants to have these beliefs. Yeah. But I don't want to be confronted with them wow. in such a way Think over of my morning coffee. How many political messages you can put in Starbucks and coffee? Yeah, well, apparently Starbucks might actually be reconsidering their entire foam policy. Yeah. Really? I yeah. I guess they need to. Yeah, they've sent, they've, 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 apologi they've apologized to her. Um, she has free Starbucks for life because that can really... That's... Maybe. If she's not too traumatized. can change the person. Change it can change the person. person. Right. Economically, it can change the person yeah. completely. I mean, is, it, yeah. would, it would add about a buck twenty-five a day to Starbucks. Is it that is, uh, cheap? No, it's not at all. It's, no, I was going to say. I was just imagining yeah, that it's it's much coffee would cost that. Yeah. <laughs> so it could be a good thing for her. I she doesn't mean, know yeah. who the guy is. She said she was so uh, appalled, I could not bring myself to look at the young man. This who is served Louisiana. Me. This is Louisiana. Yeah. Wow. This this person is so it. fair. Uh, most likely pretending she doesn't know or uh, mm. who this who this person yeah. is. Being really reasonable in the she comments. She's really reasonable. I'm telling you, yeah. she just wants free coffees, people. Don't get uh, don't get excited. Free yes, coffee. Okay. Free Daniel coffee. Ross, thank you both for joining us. After the break, the new cat emporium. Oh no! In London, attracts coffee lovers who have a weak spot for cats. Yes, mean I think you should stay. I'm. Stop, Maybe you should, yeah, replace me. First, let's hear some more of this morning headline. Good morning, and thank you for staying with us. We're joined now by the journalist, environment defender, and the cute animal video bringer, Netta Khitu. Good morning, Netta. Good morning, Yale. So you're, we're going to start with animals, <clears throat> yes. but not, they are cute. But they're, unfortunately, it's <laughs> they not are very cute, sense. and they're good news for them, the oh, whales. Good news for them, yes. but because of a horrible thing that's been happening. Exactly. So Japan has been um, hunting whales for years now. It's a really long tradition, and they're doing it in scores and in really bad and cruel uh, ways. And now the... Um, International Court of Justice in Hague, in The Hague, uh, decided that it's illegal. What's happening is that there is um, an international ban on um, uh, well whale hunting, hunting mm -hmm. and Japan said that they're doing it for scientific research. Uh, this is allowed. And now the The Hague uh, Court said that it's not true, they're not doing it for scientific research. I mean, the research. pictures speak for themselves, yes. the bloody pictures that yes. we see all the time. And Greenpeace exactly. has been very active. Greenpeace has been really active about it and they are actually, to yes, the ships yeah, and, and stopping it with their own ships yeah and uh, bringing awareness and it helped in a way and now uh, we have to see if uh, Japan will abide by the rule by the, the ICG yeah the, the ICJ uh, did the ICJ how did it get to there was it because uh, of Greenpeace activists? yeah oh, it was Greenpeace, Greenpeace <laughs> and uh, Australia uh, together they brought the case um, against Japan and they said that it's not true and they brought evidence that it's not for scientific research they're actually killing them for their meat and mm -hmm. other a byproduct, skin, yes, yeah. and uh, Japan uh, was not able to prove that it is uh, actually for scientific research. But all the ships, the Japanese ships, they have um, like a, they have certificate to do that, and now Japan have to take their certificate and not allow them to go and actually it's like offshore. And a big part of their economy. Why would Japan? Why is Japan so, so adamant on? Uh, yeah, it, you, it's traditional. It's, right. Yeah, and it used to be a big part of the economy, but rumor says that they are now they're not. No, it's not very popular as it used to be, and there's many, there's a lot of meat stored in uh, refrigerators across the country with you know, no buyers. Yeah. yeah. So, um, well, but this it, is a big, it's a big move. We'll yeah, see it's if, a big uh, move. It's really nice, and it's the first time I think The Hague is really, you know, taking uh, an environmental yeah, issue into Yeah, time. and a really strong game. Um, Good, you know, well, statement. when there's no dictator to try, then go straight to, to the animals. I'm happy about that. What else yes. do you have? We are uh, with animals in the Louvre this time, sheeps. <laughs> arrived to deliver. This is really cool video. Uh, it's wow. uh, farmers from uh, out of Paris. They just <laughs> they brought a um, dozen <laughs> sheep to the Louvre to protest the uh, reform in the agriculture that is coming to happen. So why did uh, the artwork do <clears throat> bad that they had to get the sheep in? Uh, What's the <clears throat> connection? It's really crazy. They went inside and they actually managed to do so, you know, to bypass all the guards. And uh, what the statement is that uh, sheep do not belong to the museum and also we do not belong here. So please uh, let us be and work and, you know, and live in our rural area and, you know, wow. and That's stay such a out of Paris. creative way of uh, protesting. Yes. yes, it's very creative and it got a lot of attention, as you it can did. see. And but the uh, sheep don't look so happy to be No, there. they don't look happy. Yeah. I was like, oh, 
oh no, yeah. not in the metro. <laughs> I, I, yeah. So besides and the PR, did anything happen after? Uh, the reform is to industrialize uh, the French uh, agriculture, and they are against it, of course, and they say that also it's tradition, it's the French kitchen, you know, they can't make this, uh, you know, uh, special, famous, and unique uh, French cheese with the industrialization. Mm -hmm. uh, the government, on her hand, uh, says that it's the EU that you know, putting the restrictions yeah, and exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and no, let's see what happens. The vote will be next week for the I guess, reform. I guess everything is yeah. okay as long as nothing touched the Mona Lisa. No, or nothing touched the Mona. <laughs> I think they wouldn't do that. <laughs> they wouldn't yeah. take the risk of uh, yeah. you know. But yeah, everybody talked about it. Two K Instagram pictures, of course. They uh, uh, yeah, they reached their, um, their goal. goal. Yes. Good. Good. I'm glad. Yes. So the, and this week there was a really important UN report about right. climate change. We covered it extensively. <clears throat> yes, I know. Yeah. Uh, so um, the, what's special about it, and this is why I want to talk about it again, is that it, it talks about the future and not about the past. Mm -hmm. It doesn't talk about how we, the human race, is responsible. It talks about how we can, you know, prepare for what's coming and what should we do. And it also blames governments and individuals the same uh, what kind amount of, of blame uh, that we should, you know. Oh, personally. Yeah. Yeah, not yeah. naming anyone. Uh, no, no, not okay. naming. But uh, the public should do something about it. Take public transportation, choose the bicycle, uh, be vegan, uh, many things like that. And also governments. Vegan, not vegetarian? They say vegan? Uh, they didn't say exactly, but they say choose your That's food. That's your little add-in. Yes. <laughs> choose your food wisely. Uh -huh. And uh, for governments, they should you know, regulate more um, the industry, cars, uh, transportation, everything. So this was interesting because it was a different point of view than usual. Do they name any countries that especially uh, are um, not abiding by the rules? Or? No, they didn't name countries, but they said that the poor countries you know, Obviously, again, yeah, yeah, are suffering more than the rich, and the rich are to blame more than the poor. Right. This is the regular, yeah, point of view. As usual, the the fight over the resources. Yes. All right, we got to the the item that I'm I've been yes, uh, worried about all, all, all <laughs> afraid, <show>. yeah, <laughs> afraid of. In London, they opened the cat cafe. <laughs> it's very popular cat cafe in yeah. uh, in the Far East, and now it arrived to Europe. Actually, Paris was the first city to do that, and London is the next. And uh, dozen cats sit there you can just come and pet them you know <laughs> while you <laughs> drink your tea okay. at four o'clock and uh, the the place is actually booked until june yeah so uh, even if you a, want to yes mean k was here right here and she said that she's yes. going back to london to visit and she can't know it's booked that uh, yeah it's really crazy and popular and also the parisian one is very very popular so yeah. i guess Unlike you, and many people like cats. I, I realize that. I mean, as you said, Instagram is uh, filled yeah. with uh, cats and so forth. And yeah, the whole, and YouTube. Yeah. And, yeah. I'm not They're the that. new yeah, gods, in a way. <laughs> You'd go. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I would go. Though I have one at my home and... Yeah, you make yeah. tea and have yeah, a cat exactly. and cut your so, cat and you have the whole thing. Yeah, exactly. Fine. So I'll leave it for other people. And let's finish uh, the corner with some nice uh, pictures from Earth Hour that was uh, last weekend. Mm -hmm. uh, there are beautiful pictures from... Um, uh, Saudi Arabia, as you can see, the yeah. most famous uh, symbol of Saudi Arabia went um, lightless. Right. Also the Eiffel Tower, um, India, many, many places in their beautiful um, pictures. And here in Tel Aviv, usually we do have something. Yeah, in Tel Aviv it wasn't this year. Um, Municipality was uh, yeah. falling asleep during yeah, the Yeah, it's a good uh, question to ask. Usually, uh, do, yeah, they do take do off something. the lights out of the municipality building. Yeah. <laughs> I think I heard because it was on Shabbat there was yeah. a oh, no. issue with yeah. electricity and. Yeah, probably that. Next year. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it connects to your uh, cultural corner, uh, Spike. Spider-Man was the symbol of this year Earth Hour, and he was everywhere. And as you can see, the stars of the Spider-Man film uh, went everywhere to promote uh -huh. Earth Hour and also and, and besides the, the character PR itself. That it does, of course, does it really impact for the rest yeah? Of they the say year? they can they take that out of it, right. and they see how much you know less emission in this hour and how much less electricity and energy, and yeah, it helps. And people realize that there is something you know one can do, and that you can save. Yeah, uh, just hopefully it's not just once once a year, one hour a day. Yes. But well, yes. that's a that's a start. Neta yes. thank you. You're still with thank us. You. And uh, Roni, I didn't introduce you. We're here now with uh, Wine It's America's journalist Roni Stav. What do you hear with us? For? So uh, the first thing we have uh, this week's is uh, the 20th anniversary for Kurt Cobain's death. 
Um, so mm. there's a whole, um, you know, everyone's starting to uh, raise questions yeah. as every year. Uh, but this year, um, NME magazine said that um, Courtney Love mentioned that it's very likely there will be a musical about uh, Cobain, his death, and wow. his um, yeah, and his music. So that's a little. Far fetched, you know. There were very. Um, there's a lot of uh, movies and biopic that were made um, off his um, tradition, legacy, what he left behind, and the whole story. Mm -hmm. um, actually, this year, um, Seattle police reopened the case really? once again. New yeah. evidence. Uh, they released new photos of the death, uh, but they found nothing new. Mm -hmm. So uh, we keep on. Uh, yeah, Courtney you know, Love also likes to get her name out there. Yeah, here you know, and there. but this time she's like, um, the fans were really encouraging me to do it. And me and Francis, uh, their uh, their daughter, right. uh, will be very uh, happy to see something on stage. But we need the best um, writers, and she she's basically kind of calling out for like, hey, if you yeah. want to come and she's make thing. a no, musical, yeah. I'll totally be into it. So she just tweeted about the Malaysian Airlines. She, found the, she found the Malaysian Airlines. So I mean, oh well, there I'm you glad go. That, uh, yeah. Good there, job. Very good at PR. Yeah, yeah. She's she's, she's good the, about finding yeah. things. So. All right. Well, we'll see the show once it comes out. If anyone. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Love. We'll That's see. Right. We'll see what she's uh, planning for us. What um, else? And we have another, uh, I guess, living dead kind of. Uh, it's a very uh, shady kind of. Uh, but it's much, much. Uh, it's much newer than. Uh, it's than much Kirk. newer. Yeah, it's much newer. But once again, uh, the dead rise in order to uh, make some new entertainment coming. Uh, James Gandolfini's oh. uh, new film, The Drop. Wow. Uh, yeah, the tra They just released the trailer uh, the other day. Um, he died it, in the mid-production. No, uh, no. Um, he was able to finish the film, and mm -hmm. then he died of a heart attack uh, last June. Uh, but they just released the movie. Um, it's about uh, it's a crime drama centered around uh, Brooklyn Brooklyn's uh, gangster underworld. Mm -hmm. um, he so always, very, he uh, yeah, yeah. He's, he's yeah. kind of you know originating another uh, Tony Soprano uh, type of a role. Um, yeah, and it's very, you know, it's heartbreaking. Uh, Indeed, and to it probably see. will do wonders. I mean, for the box office, of course, people. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, and and uh, just a little bit about the drop. Um, it's it's actually super interesting, and uh, it's uh, the um, the writer um, uh, Denise Lien. Um, he uh, wrote the novels of uh, Shutter Island, uh, Mystic River, Gone mm -hmm. Baby Gone. So many of his novels already uh, became into blockbusters. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Uh, maybe that's what's coming for us. Yeah. Uh, that here. plus, of course, uh, yeah. someone that, that always looks helps, like uh, yeah, it looks like the crowd's gonna definitely. But it's strange. Most of his films are not so good, and he was amazing on well, TV he, in Sopranos. But he it's wasn't true. able to. They they were talking about his. You know, they're talking about um, his de decisions and what movies yeah, he, they were he took or didn't decisions. take, and and I think that. You see him so much as uh, Tony Soprano yeah. that everything else you're like, ah, you're kind of doing that role, or oh, why are you not like, just uh, being Tony Sarah Soprano? Sarah Parker has the yeah. same kind of uh, exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. All, uh, yeah, they just they and, originated yeah. such an amazing, uh, right. you know, whole type yeah. of a role, and that for you, such a long time. Yeah, yeah, John that you're Hammond just like, no, yeah. no, this is who you are. What yeah. are you doing? Why are you acting? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but actually, his last film with um, Elaine from Seinfeld, how's it called? Let's talk about it. Right, was really good, and yeah, yeah. Very no, vulnerable he's, uh, there. You know, he's really good. He has a really good uh, comedic um, sense. It, yeah. He's a really good actor. Um, it, he was on Broadway for a while, so he's a great stage actor as well. But, you know, it's just, he'll just be uh, Tony, Tony Soprano, Soprano forever. 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 forever yeah. and well, ever. The, the show itself, not only his character, the entire show itself, I think, was a masterpiece, and it yeah. kind of was mm -hmm. unprecedented in television until yeah. now. You, I mean, you really feel empathy for, yeah, for yeah, this yeah. criminal yeah. family. Absolutely. What Absolutely. else do you have? Um, so uh, we have uh, Vic Mooney's. Um, he's presenting in a Tel Aviv museum. Um, he's um, a photographer and an artist, a Brazilian photographer and artist, mm -hmm. um, that they made a movie about his work called Wasteland. Mm -hmm. um, a huge uh, movie, uh, won 50 prizes, was nominated for a Best uh, Documentary in the 83rd Oscar. Um, it's about, uh, uh, what, what, what's the name of the place um, in Rio de Janeiro, uh, mm -hmm. Jardim Gramacho. I probably said it wrong, but yeah. something like that. Um, yeah. It's um, you know, it's a little uh, place outside of uh, Rio, Rio de Janeiro, completely. Um, you know, the environment Just, there. Yeah. If yeah. talking about environment, um, it's not really 
two thumbs up no. uh, for environment there. Uh, but he went with a bunch of pickers and uh, they collected the waste, created it into um, into art pieces, and then actually uh, it made their way uh, into auction houses all around wow. Europe. Anything especially that's known from his? Uh... Well, there's a lot of known uh, pieces and a lot of the known series are presenting now in uh, Tel Aviv Museum. Mm -hmm. um, it's basically called uh, Pictures Of. There's pictures of chocolate, pictures of uh, dust, pictures of waste. Um, he's creating um, old and very uh, popular art pieces um, by making them from uh, beans, chocolate, wow. uh, different, yeah. And, and there's also his own uh, agenda and his own art that is just um, his own visions. So he's a world-renowned artist. He came from absolutely. Brazil, now is in New York. And absolutely, is, is he's world-renowned. making money out of, out, of the, out, of, out of the dump. Absolutely, like absolutely. And he will be presenting his pieces tonight uh, Tonight, when it's going to open in a Tel Aviv Museum. He's going to be... Um, he's going to be there. The guest of ours. Nice. Also, the community he works with is very famous now, thanks mm -hmm. to the movie about yeah, him. Yeah, 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 yeah. It yeah. sounds right down your alley, Neta. Yes. You'll be there. Yeah, yeah. I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, did you... Uh, uh, Vic Muniz, have you ever seen him? Have you has, have you ever seen him? Have you seen his speech? No, not or yet. I've seen the film. It's really, yeah, the really film moving is... and touching. Yeah, and his work is really good. I actually, I know someone who went yesterday to see the pre-exhibition and said that it's amazing, amazing. All right, well, there we'll definitely see big uh, pieces and small ones and sculptures and yeah. Yeah, definitely Quickly, go Russell and check Crow. that out. Yeah, yeah Russell and, Crow. And with Russell Crow. And to Russell Crow, <laughs> of course. Um, well, he answered to um, Yahoo Answers. Um, they asked if he's going to be joining the new Batman Superman uh, crossover movie. Mm -hmm. And he said that, unfortunately, he will not be part of it. Uh, they quoted him because, saying, yeah. um, I think they're jumping onto a different stream. Uh, you know they're going with a different superhero world colliding. jor is more in line with Superman's origin story, uh, which doesn't seem to be the focus of the much anticipated new installment. At hmm. the same time, he tweeted Meaning he's saying that he's not the uh, he's not the it guy anymore. He's not the it guy That's anymore. But he really wants to be the it guy because he tweeted um, under his uh, Jorel account that um, yeah, everyone let's um, uh, let's vote for a prequel for uh, for the Superman um, movies. Well, he's so trying. so he's totally into he's it. He's into like. It. I'm not nice. into this one, but please let me be in the next one. Ronnie Stav, thank you for joining us. Neta Khitouf, thank, thank you. you. We'll be back tomorrow. You can find us on Facebook and on Twitter, and all the time on our website, i24news.tv. Next up, it's the headlines. We'll see you soon.